story nine of the human boy and the war by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story nine the revenge if anybody has done a crime dr dunston generally speaks to them before the school so that all may hear what the crime is and according to the way he speaks to them we know the sort of fate in store if he says he remembers what it was to be a boy himself there is great hope for as mitchell pointed out that means the doctor has himself committed the crime in far-off times when he was young but if he doesn't say he remembers what it was to be a boy himself then the crime is probably a crime he never committed and these are the sort he punishes worst well in the case of tudor he had never committed tudor's crime and he himself said when ragging tudor before punishment that he had never even heard of such a crime therefore the consequences were bad for tudor and he was flogged and his greatest treasure taken away from him forever it was no doubt a very peculiar crime and mitchell told tudor that it was not so much the crime itself as the destructive consequences that had put the doctor into such a bait but we found out next term that the destructive consequences had been sent home in a bill for tudor's father to pay and they amounted to two pounds so tudor caught it at home also well it was like this tudor came back for the spring term with a remarkably interesting tool called a glazier's diamond he had saved up and bought it with his own money and it was valuable having in it a real diamond the beauty of which was that it could cut glass it could also mark glass forever and after a good deal of practice on out-of-the-way panes of glass in secluded places tudor had thoroughly learned the difficult art of writing on glass we were allowed to walk round the kitchen garden sometimes upon sunday afternoons and occasionally if a boy was seedy and separated from the rest for a day or two for fear he had got something catching such a boy was allowed in the kitchen garden under the eye of harris the kitchen gardener and tudor often got queer and threatened to develop catching things though he never really did but on the days when he threatened he generally escaped lessons and was allowed in the kitchen garden needless to say that this place was full of opportunities for practising the art of writing on glass and as nothing was easier than to escape from the eye of harris he used these opportunities and wrote his name and mine and many others on cucumber frames and on the side of a hothouse used for growing grapes and also on the window of a potting shed i am pratt and tudor and me were in the lower fourth it was a class that dr dunston unfortunately took for history and on those occasions we went to his study for the lesson and stood in a row which extended from the window to the front of dr dunston's desk he sat behind the desk and took the class from there but there was a great difference in tudor and me because i was at the top of the lower fourth and he was at the bottom in the case of the doctor's history class however this was a great advantage for tudor because the bottom of the class was by the window and the top was in front of the doctor well tudor actually got the great idea of writing with his glazier's diamond on the doctor's window i advised him not but he disdained my advice and wrote in the left-hand top corner of the bottom sheet of glass he wrote very small but with great clearness and it took him seven history lessons to finish because it was only at rare moments he could do it but the doctor was now and then called out of his study by mrs dunston or somebody and once he had to go and see the mother of a new boy who had written home to say he was being starved it took ten minutes to calm his mother down and during that interval tudor finished his work he had written the amusing words bynon is a louse and we were all rather pleased except bynon but he well deserved the insult being a fearful outsider and generally hated and in any case he couldn't hit back for though he had been known to sneak many a time and oft yet it wasn't likely he would sneak about a thing that showed him in his true colours like the writing on the doctor's study window well it was a triumph in a way and everybody heard of it and it was a regular adventure to go into the doctor's study and see the insult to bynon which of course would last forever unless somebody broke the window 
and in fact Bynan once told me in a fit of rage that he meant to break the window and take the consequences but he hadn't the pluck even when he got an excellent chance to do so and when in despair he tried to bribe other chaps to break the window he hadn't enough money so he failed in every way and the insult stood i must remind you the writing was very small and could only be seen by careful scrutiny it was absolutely safe from the doctor or in fact anybody who didn't know it was there and naturally a tutor never felt the slightest fear that it would ever be seen by the eyes of an enemy when therefore it was discovered and shown to the doctor and all was lost tudor felt bitterly surprised it came out that a housemaid who disliked bannon found it when she was cleaning the window and she showed it to milly dunstan and the hateful milly who loathed tudor because he had once given her a cough lozenge of a deadly kind and made her suck it before she had found out the truth promptly told her mother about the inscription and her mother sneaked to the doctor discovery might still have been avoided but unfortunately tudor's glazier's diamond was well known because he had been reported by brown for scratching brown's looking-glass over the mantel in brown's study when he thought brown was miles away and brown came in at the critical moment so dunstan knew only too well that tudor had a glazier's diamond and owing to the laws of cause and effect felt quite sure that tudor had done the fatal deed therefore tudor suffered the full penalty and dr dunstan told the school that tudor's coarseness was only exceeded by his lawless insolence and contempt for private property that it should have been done in his own study during intervals of respite in the history lesson naturally had its effect on the doctor and made it worse for tudor the glazier's diamond had to be given up and tudor was flogged but being very apt to crock and often bursting out coughing without any reason the doctor did not flog tudor to any great extent and it was not the flogging but the loss of his glazier's diamond that made tudor so mad and resolved him on his revenge well he had a very revengeful nature as a matter of fact and if anybody scored on him he was never as you may say contented with life in general until he had scored back and he always did so and sometimes though he might have to wait for a term or even two he was like the elephant that a man stuck a pin into who remembered it and instantly killed the man when he met him again twenty years later to be revenged in an ordinary way is of course easy but to be revenged against the doctor is far from easy and i reminded tudor how hard it had been even to revenge himself on brown when brown scored heavily off him and if it was hard to be revenged on a master like brown what would it be to strike a blow at the doctor he said it might or might not come off but he should be poor company for me or anybody until he had a try and he developed his scheme of a revenge and thought of nothing else until the idea was ready to be put into execution he said it's not so much revenge really as simple justice he took my glazier's diamond which was the thing i valued most in the world naturally and what i ought to do if i could pratt would it be to take from him the thing he values most in the world i said that's hidden from you and he said no it isn't the thing that he values most in the world is mrs dunstan i said well you can't take her away from him and he said i might some people would remove her by death of course i wouldn't do anything like that she's all right though how she can live with a grey and brutal beast like the doctor i don't know or anybody but of course i can't strike him there i've merely decided to take something he can't do without he'll be able to make it good in time but not all in a minute and in the meanwhile he'll look a fool besides being useless to the world at large it was dangerous but interesting i said what could you take so important as all that without being spotted and he said swear not to tell anybody living and i swore then he said his glasses it was a great thought worthy of tudor and of course without his glasses the doctor would be hopelessly done he cannot read a line without them and when he takes a greek class strange to say 
he wears two pairs his ordinary double glasses against the naked eye and a pair of common spectacles of very large size on his nose outside in this elaborate way he reads greek well i praised tudor but reminded him it was stealing and he said i know that's where the justice comes in he stole my glazier's diamond now i'm going to steal his glasses shall you ever give them back i asked and he said i may or i may not the first thing is to get them he takes them off to stretch his eyes sometimes i reminded tudor yes and for tea said tudor if he goes into mrs dunstan's room for a hasty cup of tea he generally leaves the glasses in the study on his desk till he comes back to work well tudor got them in a week from the day he decided to take them he had an opportunity every day that week he had contrived to be around when tea-time came on and once dr dunstan found him hanging about the passage and told him to be gone but he was crowned with success and that same night in the playground by the light of my electric torch tudor showed me the solemn sight of the double eyeglasses of the doctor actually in his hand well he was fearfully excited about it and concealed the glasses for a few hours in his play-box then fearing there might be a hue and cry and everything stirred to its foundations he took the glasses out just before supper and concealed them in a crevice on the top of the playground wall only known to me and him that night he did not sleep for hours and nor did i i pictured the doctor's terrible anger at having to stop reading the news of the war and tudor told me next morning that he had put the doctor out of action for all school purposes as well as private reading and we might hope for at least three days without him as it would take fully that time to manufacture such glasses as he wore but a bitter disappointment was in store for tudor and when the usual moment came for prayers in the chapel before breakfast lo and behold dr dunstan sailed in with a pair of glasses perched on his nose in the customary place we could hardly believe our eyes then we quickly perceived that dunstan evidently kept a reserve pair of glasses for fear of accidents and the accident had happened and he had fallen back upon the reserve pair no doubt in triumph well tudor said it was gall and wormwood to be done like that and even thought of stealing the second pair of glasses but then a strange and sudden thing overtook tudor and the very next sunday a man came to preach at the chapel service for a good cause and the good cause was a medical drug fund for natives in the wilds of africa these natives become christians under steady pressure and after that always seem to be in need of drugs especially quinine and tudor who owing to his lungs and one thing and another had a good experience of drugs was deeply interested and gave sixpence to the medical drug fund and showed a strong inclination to become a collector for the medical drug missionary i had often heard of sermons altering a person's ideas and making him or her inclined to be different from that moment onwards but i never saw it actually happen in real life before yet in the case of tudor that medical drug sermon and the stirring anecdotes of the savage tribes tamed into well-behaved invalids by the missionary had a wonderful effect upon him and it took the strange form of making him rather downhearted about dr dunstan's glasses nothing had been said when they disappeared and no fuss was made at all and i advised him just to take them back quietly when a chance presented itself and slip them under some papers on the doctor's desk and leave the rest to time i said you'd better do it now while this feeling about being a collector for the missionary is on you it will soon pass off and then you won't want to give them back he said to show you how i did feel before hearing the drug missionary pratt i may tell you that i had an idea of taking the glasses home next holidays and buying a new glazier's diamond and writing on the glasses the bitter words thou shalt not steal and then returning them to his desk next term but there are two very good reasons why i shall not do that one is this strong pro-missionary feeling in me and the other is that if i did dunstan would guess to a dead certainty who had done it knowing only too well what i can do in the matter of writing on glass he would i told tudor so the sooner you put them back unharmed the better 
i shall said tudor and i am going to return them in a very peculiar way i am going to hide them in a certain place and then i am going to write an anonymous letter to dunston telling him they are in that place well i thought nothing of this idea i said why make it so beastly complicated besides anonymous letters are often traced by skilled detectives and if it was found you wrote it where are you then and he said i have no fear about that because the letter will all be carefully printed and my reason for writing a letter at all is to explain to him that the unknown who took his glasses away is sorry what on earth does that matter to him i said well it matters to me explained tudor as you know that drug missionary made a great impression upon me and i have come to be very sick with myself that i did this thing of course i am not nearly sick enough to give the show away and tell dunston i did it but i am sick enough to say i am sorry and i want him to know it anonymously well this was beyond me and i told tudor so he then said sometimes pratt people don't pay quite enough income tax but presently there comes a feeling over them that they have defrauded the innocent and trustful government and their hearts are softened i dare say often by a missionary like mine was and then they send five pound notes by great stealth to the chancellor of the exchequer and feel better and their consciences are quickly cured but they take jolly good care not to send their names because they know that if they did the chancellor of the exchequer would go much further and far from rewarding them for their conduct would very likely want more still and never trust them again about their incomes and persecute them to their dying day and it's like that with me then i saw what he meant and i also saw that there may be a great danger in listening to missionaries and was exceedingly sorry that tudor had done so i still advised him not to write to the doctor and i felt sure his conscience would be just as comfortable if he didn't but when tudor decides to carry out a project he carries it out and he is generally very unpleasant till he has accordingly he dropped the doctor's glasses into a deep indian jar which stood on the mantelpiece in the study and then in great secret with me he wrote his letter it happened he had just got a new latin delectus and at the end of this book was a sheet of clean paper without a mark upon it we cut it out with a penknife and took a school envelope and two halfpenny stamps and wrote the letter and posted it to the doctor on the following day well the letter ran in these words all printed so that there was no handwriting in it and the envelope needless to say was also printed in a very dexterous and utterly misleading manner dear sir i regret to have to confess that i stole your eyeglasses in a bad moment there was a very good reason but all the same i am sorry and also clearly know now that it was a very wrong thing to do it was a revenge but it came to nothing because you had a pair in reserve i am glad you did i prefer to be unknown your glasses are in a beautiful and rare indian jar at the left-hand corner of your mantelpiece and i hope you will forgive because my eyes have been opened by the visit of the drug missionary to merivale and i am sorry i am dear sir your well-wisher the unknown well this a good and mysterious letter tudor posted and the very next morning curiously enough he entirely ceased to want to collect for the drug missionary in fact from that moment he fell back quite into his usual way of looking at things and by the next evening actually said he was sorry he had given dr dunston back his glasses but he was sorrier still three days later for then a very shattering event indeed happened to tudor the doctor sent for him and he went without the least fear to find his anonymous letter lying on the doctor's desk i heard the whole amazing story afterwards the doctor asked him first if he had written the letter and being taken utterly unawares and frightfully fluttered at the shock almost before he knew what he was doing you may say tudor confessed that he had then the doctor told him how vain it was for any boy to seek to deceive him he said you see how swiftly your sin has found you out tudor and tudor admitted it had he was now of course prepared for the worst 
yet as he told me his chief feeling at that moment was not so much terror as a frightful longing to know how the doctor had spotted him of course he couldn't dare to ask so he merely admitted that his sin certainly had found him out quicker than he expected and then rather craftily he said he was glad it had well the doctor didn't believe this but he was not in a particularly severe mood that evening strange to say and he told tudor exactly what had happened he said it may interest you to know misguided boy that mentioning your anonymous letter to mr brown and informing him that i had found my lost glasses in the spot indicated he evinced a kindly concern and even assured me that he would probably have no great difficulty in discovering the culprit in the brief space of four-and-twenty hours he did so perceiving that the paper on which you wrote was obviously from a book of a certain folio his first care was to ascertain by comparisons of size from what work it had come perceiving also that the paper was extraordinarily clean he had no difficulty in concluding it was extracted from a new book he then discovered that the pages came from a latin delectus and on further inquiry was able to learn that three copies of the work had recently been issued to members of the lower fourth pursuing his investigations when the boys had retired to rest he speedily marked down the mutilated volume in your desk tutor and while i have already thanked him for his zeal and penetration i feel little doubt that a time will come when looking back on this dark page in your history you will thank him also well tudor didn't give his views about brown but he said the glasses had been very much on his mind only he had not liked to return them without saying he was bitterly sorry he told me afterwards that he was very nearly saying to dr dunstan that some boys would ever turn the glasses without even an anonymous letter of regret but fortunately he did not the doctor then took him through the letter and invited him to throw light upon it he was chiefly interested in the part about revenge and he forced tudor to explain that the revenge was because dr dunstan had taken away his glazier's diamond dr dunstan then said that incident was long ago closed and that in fact after the pane of glass in his study had been taken out and a new one put in he had dismissed the matter from his mind he seemed much surprised that tudor had not dismissed the matter from his mind also and he told him that the revengeful spirit always came to grief in the long run he then wound up by saying you sign yourself the unknown wretched boy but let this be a lesson to you that henceforth you are neither unknown to your headmaster or your god for the rest since you have the grace in this penitential though patronizing communication to express sincere regret at your conduct and also to regard the fact that you are my well-wisher though that is not at all the sort of expression suitable from a fourth form scholar to his headmaster since i say i find these signs of grace i shall not inflict the extreme penalty on this occasion for the moment i have not determined on my next step and will thank you to wait upon me this time to-morrow now you may go and tudor said thank you very much sir and went he was a great deal cast down and admitted for once i was right but though his feeling for the doctor was now on the whole one of patience and thankfulness his feeling for brown was very different and when the wretched brown grinned at tudor and rotted him in class and told the whole story of how he had played the beastly sleuth hound on tudor and started calling him the unknown tudor took it with dignified silence and from that instant started to plan the greatest revenge of his life he told me that it might not be at merivale he would be revenged but in the world at large and if it was not until brown had grown old and bald-headed the end was bound to be just the same and the rest of brown's life however long it might last would undoubtedly be ruined by tudor and he also said that he was jolly glad the missionary feeling had left him so that not a shadow of remorse might come between him and brown when the day arrived well there was only one thing more rather interesting about tudor's revenge on the doctor and that was dr dunstan's revenge on tudor 
tudor went to him again at the appointed time and after a lot of jaw the doctor told tudor that he must now write out the complete article on optics in the encyclopaedia britannica including all the algebra and everything there were exactly ten huge pages of this deadly stuff and tudor was fairly frantic at first but curious to relate after he had done one page he found it quite interesting in its way then it got more and more interesting as it went on and tudor finally decided that there was no doubt with his strong feeling for the science of optics that he ought to take it up as a profession i asked him if he should take up microscopes or telescopes and he said telescopes certainly because that meant astronomy and in time you might rise to be the astronomer royal at greenwich which was something i said it is a great thing to know the stars and comets by their names and he said yes pratt and another great advantage of astronomy is that you may be out all night whenever you choose and nobody can say a word against you so the extraordinary event came about that what dr dunstan intended as a stiff imposition and sharp punishment on tudor really worked in a very different manner and instead of crushing tudor and grinding him under the heel of dr dunstan so to speak only put into tudor the splendid idea of mastering the heavens and then some day getting the perfect freedom by night of an astronomer royal of greenwich End of Story 9story ten of the human boy and the war by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story ten the turbot's aunt of course he was not really called turbot but just after he came to merivale some ass in the fifth started the silly rag of calling everybody after a fish and pretty well every fish known to science was rung in in fact they just about went round sometimes the likeness was fairly clear and the simile was good for instance being head of the school i was called salmon which is the king of fish and as i am underhung and have rather fierce eyes there was a certain fitness in calling me salmon but after i had decided that abbott could not have his colours for footer being lame there was a feeling against me among abbott's friends and tracy called me tinned salmon which was merely silly and not in the least amusing nor was it amusing to call maybrick sardine because he kept tins of this fish in his desk but john dory was all right for nicholas that being the ugliest fish in the sea and nicholas the ugliest chap at merivale porpoise was true for preston who inclines to great fatness and blows after exertion in a very porpoise-like way but to call briggs herring because he was a doter on a bloater as tracy said and to call tracy himself a torpedo ray because he was always trying to give shocks was footling without being funny on the other hand it was neat to call pratt cuttlefish because he was always inky to the elbows and as far as bradwell was concerned the nickname of turbot suited him very well owing to his eyes which always goggled if a master spoke to him and also owing to his mouth which was all lips and rather one-sided when he laughed kids of course have a poor sense of what is really funny owing to their general ignorance yet they prefer their own feeble jokes to ours a joke that the sixth sees in a moment is utterly lost on them while utter piffle that no sane person would smile at makes them scream we for instance called mitchell shark because of his well-known habits over money but this did not amuse the kids in the least while they called forbes minimus whale because he was the smallest boy in the school which naturally could not cause anybody but an idiot the least amusement well bradwell was far from interesting from a mental point of view having as our master mr fortescue said apparently outgrown his brains he was just at his seventeenth birthday when these remarkable events happened but at first glance and in fact until you talked to him you would at once have said he was grown up 
he was in the lower fifth and it really looked as though a master was in the lower fifth rather than a pupil and he was only there because it would have been a burlesque to put him any lower though in strict justice as far as his knowledge was concerned he would have been in his right place in the upper third but he had to stop in the lower fifth and even there was an absurd sight being six feet high and very large in every way and having a distinct moustache which owing to its being black could not be hidden what a scissors could do he did but it was there and grew by night and could not be concealed he was a very finely made chap and had magnificent muscles but such was his awkwardness and stupidity that he couldn't even use these muscles properly and he was no earthly good even in the gym at games he failed utterly though he tried hard but he was too slow even for a full-back at footer and couldn't get down quick enough for a goalie in fact rapid movement seemed utterly beyond his power at cricket he was also an object of utter scorn for despite his hands which were huge he couldn't hold the simplest catch and despite his reach which was that of a six-foot chap he had not the humblest idea of timing a ball or the vaguest notion of how to play a stroke in fact such was his unworthiness that he could only have played in the third eleven and as that was naturally composed of kids of eleven and twelve it would have been an outrage to see him in it bradwell meant well but he was rather barred not from dislike but simply because he had as it were grown up before his time and had a kid's mind and a man's body in fact he fell between two stools in a manner of speaking because to the sixth and the masters he was a thing of naught while to those who had a mind like his own he was grown up and no use in any way i was the only one at merivale who understood his weird case and when he first came i let him fag for me but he was awful as a fag and such was his over-anxiety to please and shine that he never did either i had in fact to chuck him at sixteen years and eleven months of age he led rather a lonely life but when the war broke out he said he was very interested in it and asked me sometimes if i would be so good as to explain military matters to him which i did in the simplest words possible as anything like regular military terms would have been far beyond him on hearing that aeroplanes have great difficulty in descending by night he invented a scheme of stretching strong nets with a big mesh on poles ten feet above the ground spread over half a mile of landing place to catch them this showed mind in a way but he never appeared to have any real martial instinct and when once a girl in merivale handed him a white feather he stopped and took off his hat and said i quite understand what you mean but i shan't be seventeen for a fortnight yet this the girl naturally refused to believe and the turbot came to me and complained about it as a matter of fact i rather backed up the girl not for giving turbot a white feather which is a vulgar and silly thing to give anybody because you never know as the great case of fortescue showed but because she didn't believe turbot when he said he was only about to be seventeen to look at him he might easily have been married which shows appearances are very deceptive but anyway i said you can't blame a flapper for thinking you are of age to join the army bradwell anybody would think so and lots of younger-looking chaps than you have said they were eighteen and been passed without a murmur though their birth certificates would have given them away but anybody six feet high and with a clearly visible black moustache and with your muscles would pass the authorities and you may bet that many have he merely goggled and said no doubt i was right i must tell you that turbot had no father or mother and in fact nobody but a single oldish aunt who lived at plymouth but he had a guardian who sent him to merivale when his family unfortunately died and at first he stopped at merivale in the holidays but once the aunt took him for a fortnight at easter and she appeared to like him for after that he always went to her the guardian did not however like turbot and turbot would have been quite content to stop at merivale in the holidays rather than spend his time with the guardian who had no friendly feeling for him in fact you may say that turbot was a duty rather than a pleasure to the guardian 
then at the beginning of the autumn term in the first year of the war turbot's aunt wrote to dr dunstan and asked if turbot might spend saturday till monday with her because it was going to be his birthday and the doctor gave permission so turbot went and naturally was not missed in any way till monday morning then at roll call before chapel the turbot's well-known bleat was not heard and it was soon perceived that he'd done something very much out of the common nothing had been heard from his aunt apparently and so a telegram was dispatched to her and as no reply came to it dr dunstan began to worry he then sent off a telegram to the guardian and the excitement decidedly thickened after dinner the doctor sent for me as head boy and told me that the guardian had heard nothing whatever about turbot i may tell you travers he said though there is no reason to repeat it that bradwell is not persona grata with the gentleman who stands to him in loco parentis that is unfortunate for bradwell because he may lack friends in the future being a boy without any mental ability or that charm and power to please we occasionally find in the stupid lad his guardian however evinces no uneasiness at the disappearance of bradwell and my knowledge of human nature inclines me to doubt if the individual in question will much care whether bradwell returns or does not i speak of course in confidence but he is a busy man and has a large family of his own with its concomitant anxieties he sends his own boys to harrow and it is not for us to judge his motives in so doing or whether they are guided by disinterested desire for the future welfare of an obscure attorney's sons or influenced by that spirit of snobbishness from which few englishmen are entirely free now i shall ask you this afternoon travers to undertake a little mission which i can safely trust to you we are as you know very short-handed and to spare a master is almost impossible i will therefore invite you to go as far as plymouth call at number ten mutley plain villas and ask to see miss mason the maternal aunt of bradwell and his sole surviving relative it is a somewhat delicate duty and you must regard it as a compliment that i seek your aid here is half a crown for your return railway fare you will alight at mutley station and should catch the five thirty train back to merivale the lady has not responded to my telegram hence my desire before putting the matter in the hands of the police to learn all she may be able to tell us present my card and she will see you at once if at home if not wait until she returns it was rather a responsible thing and a great compliment to me so i went first putting on my best clothes and a new pair of gloves arrived at plymouth i got out at mutley and easily found mutley plain villas which were only a quarter of a mile from the railway the house was small but very neat in appearance and the door knocker which was of highly polished brass gave a loud tapping sound into the hall there was no sign of the turbot a servant of considerable age answered my knock and when i asked her if miss mason was at home she replied that she was she told me to walk in which i did i then gave her dr dunstan's card and was shown into a neat drawing-room which had a piano in it and a pile of khaki wool on a sofa there was also an illustrated newspaper in the room and i sat down on a chair and read the illustrated newspaper until miss mason arrived presently she came and proved younger than her servant though still not in reality young she was unlike bradwell in every way even her eyes did not resemble his being black and small you might say beady and her mouth had thin lips which revealed lustrous teeth which might have been false ones though on the other hand they might not curiously enough she said i was just writing a letter to dr dunstan when you arrived now i can send a message by you instead are you his son no miss mason i answered i am travers the head boy at merivale school how interesting she said and what are you going to do in the world travers i leave next term this is my last term in fact and i am then going to try for woolwich i said that means the army of course she answered i hope you will pass well i then thanked her for this kind wish and said i hoped so too 
owing to the war i explained there is no very great difficulty in passing into woolwich at present and i hope to get on quickly and take my place in the fighting line before the war is over she approved of this quite right she said i never wanted to be a man before the war but i do now she spoke in a very martial and sporting way and rang for tea this was good of its kind and when i had eaten pretty well everything after handing her each dish first she asked me if i would like an egg and of course i said i would then she ordered the old servant to boil two eggs and the old servant did so and i ate them both we talked of the war and funnily enough i quite forgot all about the turbot till a clock chimed on the mantel-shelf the hour of five this as it were reminded me of my mission i must soon go back to the station i said so perhaps you will now be so kind as to tell me about turbot and who is turbot she asked so i had to explain that we were all called fish owing to a silly joke and i also hoped that she would not think that i meant anything rude to her nephew by mentioning him in that way she was not in the least annoyed and said ralph came to me on saturday and he left me on sunday morning do you know where he has gone i asked and she said i haven't the slightest idea where he has gone travers that's very serious i said because your nephew's guardian hasn't the slightest idea either her lips tightened over her dazzling teeth at the mention of the guardian and i could see she didn't like him she spoke in a sneering sort of voice and said ah really then feeling there was nothing more to discuss i got up and cleared let me know if anything transpires she said and not happening to remember exactly what transpire meant i merely said that no doubt the doctor would tell her all that might happen in the future about bradwell she shook hands in a kindly manner and saw me to the gate and such was her friendly spirit that she picked a small blue flower and gave it to me to wear put it in your buttonhole she said which i did do until i was out of sight and could chuck it away without hurting her feelings the doctor didn't seem to like what i had to say and evidently thought i hadn't got it right his aunt appears as callous as his guardian said the doctor i am to understand that he went out on sunday morning and did not return and that miss mason has not the slightest idea where he's gone to that's what she made me understand sir i said i fail to credit it answered the doctor then he dismissed me rather slightingly and sent for brown who always does the detective business at merivale there was a good deal of quiet excitement about it and of course we all thought turbot would be run to earth in a few hours or days at most but he never was and though the police looked into the matter and hunted far and wide they never even got a clue because apparently there wasn't one to get in fact turbot vanished off the face of the earth as far as merivale was concerned and it was a nine days wonder as the saying is and no light was ever thrown upon it till long afterwards the aunt was cross-examined by the police but she knew nothing and cared less as brown said for he cross-examined her also all she could say was that turbot had gone out early and not come home in time for church as she naturally expected a boy brought up at merivale to do which was one in the eye for merivale as for the guardian he offered a reward of ten pounds for the recovery of turbot and no more which showed the market value of turbot in that guardian's opinion the only person who really worried was the doctor and i believe he didn't leave a stone unturned to root up turbot but all in vain he had entirely disappeared and being so ordinary in appearance without any distinguishing marks he simply vanished into the void as tracy said and we sold his cricket bat at auction and one or two other things of slight value which we found in his school locker but a portrait of his mother we did not sell and i gave it to the doctor who sent it to the aunt who was much obliged for it and wrote to old dunston with great thanks and said she would keep it until the happy day when turbot turned up out of the void again and that i believe made the doctor more suspicious than ever for he always believed that miss mason knew more about the turbot than she pretended in fact he told mr fortescue that she was prevaricating and fortescue said it looked as though she might be as a matter of fact fortescue had his own theory about turbot and though he never told anybody what it was till afterwards then he told everybody because he proved to be perfectly right 
this was that fortescue who wrote such splendid war poetry but was prevented from enlisting unfortunately by an illness of the aorta which is part of the heart and when enlarged is fearfully dangerous but while he taught at merivale his soul was entirely in the war and in his spare time he did good work chiefly at the red cross hospital in the town where fifty wounded men were always on hand when they got well they went and others came and sometimes when the war slacked off the numbers sank to thirty-two or even thirty and then when it burst out more fiercely they quickly rose to fifty again milly dunstan was one of the workers there but only for swank and the sake of the uniform i believe she peeled onions and shelled peas and cut up meat and so on in the kitchen and sometimes she was allowed to go and see the wounded but i never heard that they cared much for her until they knew she worked in the kitchen then they took interest in her because she could tell them what they were going to have for supper that night and what they were going to have for dinner next day which naturally are things very important to the mind of a wounded hero mr fortescue was well liked at the hospital and took many cigarettes there also books suited to the tommies and he got to be so popular that there was a fair fight for him and if he favoured one ward and didn't go into the other for half the time the other ward got vexed about it for tommy has a jealous nature in some ways though so heroic in the field then there came rather a bad cot case called ted marmaduke and as soon as he arrived he sent a special message to the school for me and for fortescue and fortescue went to see him of course this happened long after i had left merivale and it was in fact my brother who wrote to me about it for after six months at woolwich owing to luck in the war and so on i got a commission in the royal engineers and went to france and there i heard from travers minor about the chap who wanted to see fortescue he had been wounded in the cheek and also in the leg and his face was almost hidden but his eyes were all right and what was fortescue's amazement to see the eyes of ted marmaduke goggle in the old familiar way the moment he came to his bedside for there lay the turbot and fearing that he was going to die he had determined to tell somebody the truth and not die anonymously so to speak and when he found he was at merivale of all places naturally he thought of fortescue and me but i was gone to do my bit so fortescue went and heard the true story of the wily turbot he could only tell it in pieces because it hurt him awfully to talk but in fact he wasn't allowed to talk much at a time but what happened was this he had gone to the aunt for his birthday and told her in secret that he hated merivale worse than ever and was ashamed to be there with a the moustache and everything and she was a very martial and fine woman and entirely agreed with him she told him that he was just the sort they wanted in the army and that though he could not distinguish himself at school that was nothing at such a time and she felt positive that he would jolly soon distinguish himself in the army and do things at the front that would make merivale fairly squirm to remember how it had treated him and such was the aunt's warlike instinct that when he reminded her he was only seventeen she scorned him for remembering it go to the recruiting people she said on your seventeenth birthday which is to-morrow and when they ask you how old you are say you'll be eighteen on your next birthday which will be true and he gladly did so but the aunt was fearfully crafty as well as warlike for when turbot decided to go off and enlist at plymouth under his own name she pointed out that he would instantly be traced by dr dunstan and ignominiously dragged back out of the army to merivale so she advised him to take a train to the north of england and enlist up there which he did do and he changed his name to ted marmaduke and the enlisting people in the north never smelt a rat and were quite agreeable to take him when he said he would be eighteen next birthday and such was the fine strategy of the aunt that she expressly made turbot promise not to write a line to her till he was under orders for the front therefore when she was asked if she knew where he was she could honestly say she did not of course long before he came back wounded he was entirely forgotten at merivale and when fortescue discovered him in our red cross hospital and then confessed that he had always believed this was what turbot had really done the excitement became great 
and many of the chaps asked to be allowed to go and see him and some were allowed to go but it was not till the turbot had recovered and was going back to fight that dr dunstan forgave him and he never forgave the aunt yet that amazing aunt was more than a fine strategist she was a prophet also for fortescue found out in the papers that ted marmaduke of the third yorkshires was promoted a sergeant and had won the d c m for splendid bravery in gallipoli just as his aunt had always prophesied he would of course she came to see him at the hospital but she didn't come to merivale when he got nearly right the old turbot took tea at merivale and the doctor let the past bury the past as they say and made a speech and hoped that the chaps would follow turbot's lead in certain directions though not in all but privately to the turbot he said more than this in fact he dug up the past again and reminded turbot that he should not do evil that good may come and turbot quite saw this and said he never would again then he went back to the wars once more and had good luck i'm glad to say and before he'd been a soldier eighteen months he got his commission for though such a mug at school the military instinct was in him all the time and the war naturally brought it out when he became lieutenant bradwell his guardian tried to make friends again but he scorned him as well he might though no doubt he will always be friendly with his crafty aunt for you may say that he owed pretty well everything to her masterly mind End of story ten. story eleven of the human boy and the war by eden philpox this librivox recording is in the public domain story eleven cornwallis and me and fate dr dunstan was always awfully great on the classic idea of fate he made millions of efforts to make us understand it but failed blades said he understood it and so did abbott and of course the sixth said they did but they always pretended to understand everything including the war fate is the same as greek tragedy and a very difficult subject indeed anyway cornwallis and me couldn't understand fate or how it worked exactly until that far famous whole holiday and the remarkable adventure which made cornwallis and me blaze out into great fame though only for a short while as long as it lasted however the fame was wonderful for the sudden curious result of being somebody after you have for many years been nobody not only leaves its mark on your own character but quite changes the opinion of other people about you and also the way they behave to you enemies slack off and even offer to become friends and people who have been your friends when you were nobody redouble in their affection and even get a sort of feeble fame themselves owing to being able to approach you as a matter of course and not as a favour all this happened to cornwallis and me and though fame is said to have a very bad effect on some people and make them get above themselves like the germans and austrians for instance in our case though dazzling in its way the fame died out almost as quickly as it sprang up in fact to show you what people are and what envy may do just as cornwallis and me began to sink back into our usual obscurity in the lower third some beasts such as pegram and the master brown said in public that the whole excitement was a mild attack of hysteria and utter footle and that neither cornwallis nor me had done anything but make little asses of ourselves and that it was all pure luck and not fame at all but anyway the adventure did this for cornwallis and also for me it explained what the doctor really meant by fate and afterwards we were always tremendously keen about fate and spoke well of it though before it had if anything rather bored us because at the age of ten your fate is generally so far off until the great adventure i can't honestly say i had seen fate bothering about cornwallis and he had never seen it bothering in the least about me but afterwards having as you may say got thoroughly to understand its ways and its special interest in us on a very important occasion in fact what you might call a matter of life and death we always felt a sharp interest in it and often noticed little marks of fate at work both in school and out 
sometimes for us and sometimes for other people not of course always for us because as cornwallis said and i agreed we weren't everybody and when it came to prizes and getting into elevens and other advantages fate undoubtedly favoured various chaps far more than us but as i pointed out to cornwallis after saving our lives in a very ingenious and unexpected way no doubt it had done enough for us for some years and intended to give us a rest we both saw the fairness of this and did not complain in the least at our rather bad failures in the lower third afterwards but curiously enough dr dunstan though so well up in greek tragedy and the ways of fate as a rule missed this and said our reports were a scandal and a source of the utmost discomfort to him and far from showing our gratitude to fate as we ought to have shown it after the terrible affair of foster day foster day was an important day at merivale it arose from the mists of antiquity as they say because among the first pupils old dunstan ever had when he started at merivale was a chap called foster he was very rich and his father lived at dalham on the sea coast and had a mansion and thousands of acres of land running down to the sea this foster seems to have liked the doctor and been a great success at merivale and his rich father evidently liked the doctor too and so when young foster had the bad luck to fall for his country in the boer war the rich father foster built a beautiful and precious chapel to his memory at dalham and had his soldier's son carved in pure marble and put in the chapel it was known as a memorial chapel and simply couldn't be beaten in its way and not content with doing this the rich father arranged with dunstan that fifty boys from merivale should once every year come to a service in this chapel and after the service was over be entertained in his grounds and on the seashore with games and luscious foods the doctor fell in with this excellent plan readily and now for some years on the seventh day of july which was the day the splendid young soldier foster had fallen fifty chaps from merivale drove over in brakes to dalham and attended the memorial service and sang a hymn and afterwards enjoyed themselves in the spacious grounds and on the beach for though not actually belonging to the rich old foster the beach finished off his estates and so he had a special sort of right to it and had built a boat-house where he kept a steam launch and other vessels the day came round as usual and by rather exceptional luck cornwallis and myself got into the fifty for nobody was barred and it was always arranged that a certain number of chaps from the lower school should join the giddy throng so we went in white flannels and the school blazers little knowing what lay before us the day was slightly clouded by the fact that brown was the master who took us for brown loves to display his power before strangers and make us look as small as possible in order that he may shine but the great mr foster though what he had done that was great i don't know saw through brown with ease and told him we must do what we liked and have a good time in every way not in fact hampered by brown after the service in the chapel where some good singing was done by us and a clergyman preached a rather longish sermon on duty and so on the solemn business of the day began and we had an ample meal when i tell you that there were enough raspberries and cream for all i need add no more if all those raspberries had been put in one pile we should have had no small part of a mountain as virgil so truly says the great thing after dinner was to go and bathe and ramble on the shore this was the time that brown could be most easily escaped and as he had to keep his attention on the chaps who went swimming those who did not were able to enjoy themselves in various interesting ways the tide was out and by a little dodging behind rocks cornwallis and me who did not bathe were able gradually as it were to slip out of the danger zone which we did do a magnificent and interesting beach spread out before us and we decided to explore it so we retreated fast for some distance till a cliff jutted out and entirely concealed us and then we went slower and explored as we went cornwallis had a watch and as there was no serious work on hand till tea at five o'clock we had more than two hours 
we did some natural history and found some pools full of marine wonders such as sea anemones and blenny fish which in skilled hands can be made as tame as white mice and can live out of the sea between tides we also collected shells and much to my amusement i collected one shell which i thought was empty until i felt a gentle crawling in my trousers pocket and discovered that a hermit crab had lived in the shell and was frantically trying to escape this of course i allowed him to do and no doubt he is puzzling to this day about what happened to upset his usual life on we went and when the beach got narrower and i said it was natural but cornwallis thought not he thought the tide was coming in which would account for the increasing narrowness of the beach i said in that case cornwallis we had better go back because you can see by the marks on the cliff that the tide will come here in great quantities and in fact the water will be jolly deep and cornwallis said he supposed it would the time also was getting on and we found it was past four but of course we meant getting back fast with an occasional run and had allowed half the time to get back that we allowed to go out we were just turning after going a few hundred yards farther when a most interesting thing appeared the cliffs hung over rather and were made of red sandstone and very steep but ahead of us was a ledge of rock halfway up the cliff and on it a mysterious little house made of bits of old boat and painted with tar it was extraordinary to see such a thing in such a lonely spot and cornwallis who was rather suspicious owing to the war and being a boy scout wondered if it was all right because if you are once a boy scout as travers minor pointed out you are always a boy scout and though you may not be scouting in a professional sort of way yet if anything peculiar happens or you get a chance of doing good to the country you must instantly look into it so cornwallis decided to go and examine this queer shed and i went with him the door was open but we saw no signs of life it was a solid building made of heavy timbers and there was a padlock on the door inside was a pleasant smell of tar and cobbler's wax and fish it seemed to belong to a mariner of some sort but on the other hand what mariner could possibly want to make his house in such a weird spot there was no bed or washing basin or chest of drawers to show that the stranger lived there but there were many interesting things including a lobster pot a telescope and a large lantern of the sort used on board ship i saw nothing peculiarly suspicious but cornwallis did from the first he took rather a serious view of it and when he found a green tin full of petrol his face went white and he said it was fate i said what the dickens do you mean cornwallis and he said i mean towler that this is the hiding place of a german spy there's a telescope with which he picks up periscopes and there's a lamp with which he signals to the submarines by night and there's the petrol he takes to them to replenish their tanks and this shows the doctor was right you can get fate in real life as well as greek tragedies and i said but the prawn nets and the fishing lines and corks and paint and so on and he said these things are merely blinds to distract the eye from the others so i said well what are you going to do about it and he said i'm going straight back and after tea or even before i shall tell the great mr foster there is a pro-german traitor under his cliff and offer to show him the way to the spot i'll help i said but the thing is to be careful and surprise the spy at his work just as i said these words curiously enough the spy surprised us and we found ourselves in a position that wanted enormous presence of mind suddenly we heard the sound of heavy feet outside and as there was only one way up to the hut it was clear we could not escape without being seen and if seen of course our object was lost for the spy would make a bolt of it the question was where to hide and by the best possible luck there was a chance to do so a big tarpaulin hung on a nail on the side of the hut and it was of great size and came nearly to the ground while at its feet was a seaman's box owing to the fortunate smallness of cornwallis and me there was ample room for concealment behind the tarpaulin and our feet were hidden by the box so we got behind it and hardly dared to breathe though just before the traitor came in 
cornwallis had time to whisper to me if he's come for his tarpaulin coat we're done for and he'll very likely kill us and i whispered to him be hopeful fate may be on our side and it's not the weather for a tarpaulin coat anyway then the spy came in and though i was not able to see him cornwallis by a lucky chance got a buttonhole of the coat level with his eye and saw the fearful spectacle of the spy he was a dreadful object with wickedness fairly stamped on him so cornwallis said afterwards he was a big man with humpbacked shoulders and a coconut-like head far too small for his body and legs he was gray and had a shaggy beard and a wide mouth that showed his teeth these were broken and black his nose was flat and small and his eyes rolled in his head as he looked round his hut they were black and ferocious to a most savage extent he kept making a snorting sound which was his manner of breathing he wore dirty white trousers and a jersey and upon his feet were dirty canvas shoes he had no hat and he didn't look the sort of person that fate would be interested in but you never know he suspected nothing and had not seen us come in which was the great fear of my mind the creature did not stop long yet long enough to give himself away for ever as a spy for he took one of the green tins of petrol and then saying some english swear words to himself of the worst kind went out and slammed the door behind him we nearly shouted with joy but a moment later our joy was changed into the most terrible sorrow because the spy fastened the door behind him we heard a chain rattle and a padlock click so there we were entirely at the mercy of a creature evidently quite dead to pity in every way this was of course fate again as cornwallis pointed out there was a window about a foot square high up in the roof of the hut and when the spy shut the door and locked us in everything became dark excepting for the light from this narrow window therefore when we were sure our enemy had gone and there was not a sound outside i got on to a table and cornwallis climbed on my back from which he was able to look out through the window luckily it faced the sea and cornwallis reported that the sea had come a great deal nearer and that the spy was only about fifty yards off he stood on a sort of pier of rocks and was pulling in a rope to which was attached a small motor-boat then naturally i wanted to get on cornwallis's shoulders but he told me not to move for a moment then he said that the spy had got into the boat and was evidently going to sea and then he said he had gone i next climbed on to cornwallis and so proved the truth of his words for i distinctly saw the motor-boat speed off with the spy in it i also saw that the tide had come in and soon it was actually beating against the rocks twenty-five feet or so below us when the motor-boat had disappeared in a westerly direction cornwallis and me got down off the table and considered what we ought to do the first thing is to make every possible effort to escape at any cost i said but he said that he had already thought of that and felt pretty certain it was beyond our power the window seemed the only hopeful place but it was made not to open and the glass was thick and cornwallis said we couldn't have got through the hole even if there had been no glass but i said it is well known cornwallis that if a man can get his head through a hole he can get his body through and he said it isn't well known at all you might because you have got a head like a tadpole but i couldn't i said i was sure i had read it somewhere but anyway it didn't matter we examined the hut thoroughly and found it was only too well and solidly made we were utter prisoners in fact and owing to the spy not knowing it might very likely be left to die of starvation he might even have gone to join a submarine and never come back perhaps he does know we are here all the time said cornwallis perhaps he spotted us and pretended he didn't in that case he may have locked us in deliberately to starve us not caring to waste a shot on us this thought depressed us a good deal and presently the sun sank and the light began to fade and a seagull that settled outside on the roof uttered a melancholy and doleful squawk of course we were far from despairing yet and cornwallis made a cheerful remark and reminded me that if we had eaten our last meal on earth at any rate it was a jolly good one 
and i said there may be food concealed here for that matter we'd better have a good hunt and look into every hole and corner before it is dark this we did without success there were many strange things there including pieces of wreckage a bit of an old ship's steering wheel and a brass bell with a ship's name on it but there was nothing eatable excepting some fish to bait a lobster pot and the fish hadn't been caught yesterday and we had by no means reached the stage of exhaustion in which we could regard it as food cornwallis said as a matter of fact our great enemy will be thirst i am frightfully thirsty already for that matter and i said so am i now you mention it as the light died away we held a sort of a council and tried to decide what exactly was our duty to england firstly and to ourselves secondly we talked a good deal until our voices grew queer to ourselves and it all came back to the same simple fact our duty was to get out and we could not then i had the best idea that had yet come to us i said as we can't get out we must try and get somebody in the outer world to let us out the only question is shall we attract anybody but the spy if we raise an alarm cornwallis said of course that was the question but it didn't matter because we couldn't raise an alarm i said if we howl steadily together once every sixty seconds by your watch like a minute gun at sea somebody is bound to hear sooner or later and he said far from it towler we shall only tire ourselves out and get hungry as well as thirsty for no good our voices wouldn't go any distance through these solid walls and even if they did we are evidently in a frightfully lonely and secluded place miles and miles from civilization else the spy wouldn't have chosen it for his operations i admitted this but we did try a yell or two the result was feeble and i myself said that if any belated traveller heard it he would only murmur a prayer and cross himself and hurry on like they do in books then corsmallis decided to break the window he didn't know why exactly but he felt he wanted to be up and doing in a sort of way besides it was beastly fuggy in the spy's den so we broke the window with a boat hook and i got on the shoulders of cornwallis and had a good yell through it but no answer came then another idea struck me and it was undoubtedly this idea that saved the situation we got the old ship's bell and hung it up on a rope as near the window as possible and hammered it with the boat hook taking turns of five minutes each this created an immense volume of sound and though of course it was more far more likely to bring the spy back than anybody else we had now reached a pitch of despair and would have even welcomed the spy in a sort of way cornwallis from time to time still worried about our duty but i had long passed that for it was nine o'clock so at last i told him to shut up and hit the bell harder it was now quite dark and from time to time heavy drops of rain fell through the window the sea-going lamp would have been very useful now for we might have signalled with it but though there was an oil lamp in it we had no matches and it was therefore useless then in a lull when i was handing over the boat hook to cornwallis whose turn it was to hammer the bell we distinctly heard the stealthy sound of the motor-boat returning and cornwallis mounting my shoulders and nearly breaking my neck in his excitement reported a red light below then he heard several harsh voices cornwallis said we are now probably done for towler the spy has evidently been to a submarine and he's heard the bell and you can pretty easily guess what submarine germans will do to us in fact our fate is right bang off i said surely they wouldn't kill two kids like us and he said killing kids is their chief sport they can't be too young from babies upward so it looked pretty putrid in every way and it wouldn't be true and it wouldn't be believed if i said cornwallis and me weren't in the funk of our lives but the awful moments didn't last long for almost before the padlock was undone what should we hear but the well-known yelp of brown our first thought was that the crew of a german submarine had also got brown but even in our present condition we felt that was too mad 
all the same when he actually appeared with two other men and the spy he looked such a ghastly object and was so white and wild that it seemed clear that he was in a mess of some kind what he said when we both appeared in the lantern light was thank god for the first and last time in his life he was apparently glad to see us but after this expression of joy he instantly became beastly and in fact so much so that a man behind him who did not fear him told him not to talk so roughly to us at such a moment this man turned out to be no less a man than the great mr foster himself and he explained to us that we had put everybody to frightful anxiety and distress and that in fact he had feared the worst this much surprised us and what surprised us still more was mr foster's attitude to the spy for he called him joe and treated him in a most friendly manner we all went back to the motor-boat and while it tore away to the landing-place under mr foster's beach we told our story during this narrative which was listened to very carefully the man called joe made several remarks of a familiar nature which showed he was not in the least afraid of anybody and we found out later that he was an old and trusted servant of mr foster's who lived at dalham and who managed mr foster's motor-boat and caught lobsters for him and fish of many kinds and was in fact a sort of family friend of long standing it was admitted however that joe was very queer to look at and also odd in his ways this arose entirely from his peculiar fate because fate had had a dash at him too and when a young man he had once gone out fishing and returned to find that during his absence his wife had run away forever with another mariner this was such a surprise to him that it had quite turned his head for a time and in fact he had been odd ever since having told our tale we ventured to ask why everybody had feared the worst and mr foster explained the situation and showed what a splendid and remarkable bit of work fate had really done for cornwallis and me he said what did you intend to do when you left joe's hut and i said we were going to tear back along the beach sir and give the alarm because we thought he was a pro-german spy joe gurgled at this but did not condescend to answer and do you know what would have happened in that case asked mr foster you would have explained to us that we were on a false scent sir said cornwallis no my child i should not answered mr foster for the very good reason that i should never have seen either of you again alive nor would anybody else if you had started to go back by the beach you would both have been overtaken by the tide and most certainly been drowned crikey said cornwallis under his breath to me yes continued the good and great mr foster if joe here quite ignorant of the fact that you were trespassing in his store shed had not turned the key upon you both you would neither of you be alive to tell your story now somehow we never thought we were trespassing but doing our duty to england it just shows how different a thing looks from different points of view you ought to be very thankful said mr foster and i hope this terrible experience will leave its mark in your hearts my boys you have been spared a sad and untimely death and i trust that the memory of this night will help you both to justify your existence in time to come we said we trusted it would then brown of course put in his oar and if you had used your eyes towler and cornwallis as i have tried so often to make you he squeaked you would have seen a notice on the cliff warning people not to go beyond a certain point as the tides were very dangerous we were studying the wonders of nature sir i answered in rather a sublime tone of voice because this was no time for sitting on cornwallis and me and just then the motor-boat came to shore and it was found that we could catch the last train back to dalham so we caught it of course all the other chaps had gone back in the brakes ages ago mr foster blessed us before the train started in a very affectionate and gentlemanly way but brown did not bless us on the journey back in fact he said that he should advise the doctor to flog us we preserved a dignified silence he couldn't send a telegram on in advance as the office was shut and therefore when we arrived at merivale it was rather triumphant in a way and the news of our safe return created a great sensation in the excitement food for us was overlooked entirely until cornwallis told the matron we had had nothing to eat since dinner food was then provided 
the doctor said very little until the following day and then he told the whole story to the school after morning prayers and not until we heard it from him did we realize what a good yarn it really was but nothing was done against us much to brown's disappointment and from the way he hated cornwallis and me afterwards i believe he got ragged in private for not keeping his eye on us we wrote a very sporting letter to mr foster and said we should not forget his great kindness as long as we lived and we also wrote home and scared up ten pounds for joe because he had locked us up and saved our lives it was an enormous lot of money and far beyond what we expected my father sent five and the mother of cornwallis also sent five and cornwallis truly said it showed that my father and his mother must think much more highly of our lives than they have ever led us to believe in fact so excited was the mother of cornwallis about it that she couldn't wait till the end of the term but had to come and see him and kiss him and realize that he was still all there but my father waited until the end of the term for me he is rather a hard sort of man compared to such a man as mr foster for instance and when i did go home and explained all about what fate had done he said he hoped that i would not give fate cause to regret it at any rate during the summer holidays end of story eleven Story twelve of the Human Boy and the War by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story twelve for the Red Cross. Of course, being for the Red Cross, we were jolly well paid for all our trouble by knowing what a tremendous lift we had given the Red Cross in general. But somehow we felt that if anything too much was made of the wonderful result and too little of us who had done it because you see if a chap in the trenches covers himself with glory as they so often do it is noted down to the chap's credit and he gets a dcm or dso or a vc but in our case as tracy rather neatly put it we weren't so much as mentioned in dispatches and the bitter irony was that merivale fairly rung with the fame of dr dunstan whereas the truth was that we did everything and dr dunstan far from urging us on really threw cold water on the whole show and up to the last moment feared we were in for a grisly failure instead of a most extraordinary success there was a good deal of difference of opinion afterwards as to who sprang the idea and on the whole i don't think any one chap could take the credit it was too big a thing for one chap's mind and you might say nearly everybody in the fifth and sixth had a hand in it it grew and grew till it reached the stage of asking dr dunstan and after he had conferred with brown and fortescue and old peacock he reluctantly agreed and then it grew by leaps and bounds till it became the wonderful thing it was the idea was to give an entertainment for the funds of the red cross and blades believed it would be a better and finer entertainment if we did it absolutely on our own without any help from the masters whatever a few faint-hearted chaps thought not but they were overruled for as briggs pointed out there was no entertaining power whatever in the masters the only one who would have been any good in that way was hutchings who sang remarkably well in a bass voice of great depth but he was at the war and none of the others had any gift that could lure a paying audience no doubt they might have tried but as tracy said you couldn't ask people to pay good money just for the doubtful pleasure of seeing them trying so it was settled that as there was a great deal of mixed power of amusing an audience in the school we could do it without any assistance and fortescue supported this and advised the doctor that we should be given a free hand but peacock of all people doubted and brown who wanted to shine himself in some way thought we ought to have him and fortescue to give a backbone to the show what he was prepared to do by way of backbone we didn't ask what he did do when the time came was to show the people to their seats and his evening dress which we had not seen before was worth all the money if not more anyway fortescue got the doctor to let us do everything without help and the end justified the means as saunders very truly said though at one time it rather looked as if it might not it was announced in public that the scholars of merivale were going to give an entertainment for the red cross before christmas breaking up and when all was decided we had two clear months for the preparations 
owing to the war and one thing and another we didn't have much football that term and the show got to be the great idea in everybody's mind so much so in fact that owing to an utter breakdown in geography in the lower fourth there was a threat from headquarters that the whole thing would be knocked on the head if the work was going to suffer so we gave the lower fourth some advice on the subject and told them not one of them should do anything if they didn't buck up of course the great problem was who should be in the show and who should not that was a question for the sixth and it proved a very difficult problem because there were immense stores of talent at merivale and some of the chaps best fitted to entertain a paying audience by their great gifts absolutely refused to appear whereas strangely enough others quite useless in every way were death on appearing we even had one or two letters from mothers written to the committee of the merivale concert fairly grovelling to us to let their sons do something of course we ignored these though pegram with his usual strategy advised us to give young tudor a show of some sort because his mother and father were worth many thousands and would doubtless buy dozens of front seats if tudor did anything publicly so in one item of the performance which was a scene from the merchant of venice we let tudor and certain other kids come on in the crowd we also let cornwallis and towler sing a duet not so much because it was a thing to pay to hear but because of their great adventure on foster day when by a fluke they weren't drowned and so possessed a passing interest in merivale the program needed a fearful lot of thought and we altered it many times the first program would have taken about three days to get through and tracy said as it wasn't a wagner cycle we'd better try and cram the show into three hours and briggs said there would be encores which must be allowed for and i remembered that there must be an interval because on these occasions women want something to drink about halfway through and men want both to drink and smoke also and if they are prevented from doing these things they often turn against the performance and the last state of that show is worse than the first i am thwaites by the way and like percy minor i hope that i may go on the stage some day being much inclined to do so but his father is a professional actor and so he has a better chance than me mine being a government official in london who never goes to the theatre always being too tired to do anything after his day's work i recite when i get the chance and have already acted several times i also write poems I did not push myself forward in the least it was agreed by a sort of general understanding except in the mind of percy minor that i should play shylock in the trial scene from the merchant of venice and williams who is pretty and had many a time been rotted for his girl-like eyes and eyelashes now found that his hour had come for he was going to play portia and we hoped his beautiful appearance might carry him through though at rehearsal it was only too apparent his acting would not the first part of the show was to end with a shakespearean impersonation but this was not all though of course the cream of the night we had in the second half an original satire in one act written by tracy and entitled the white feather this would be the concluding item and as we finally decided that we would have twelve separate items that left ten to find there were some obvious things like percy minimus who had a ripping voice and was accustomed to singing both in and out of chapel so knowing he was considered class we put him down for a song and the school glee singers were also rather well thought of and we gave them two items this only left seven performances and after we had subtracted most of the chaps who were going to perform in the plays there was still an immense amount of mixed ability to choose from of course rice had to be in it though in his usual sporting way he said he could do nothing but as he was the best boxer in the school and almost as good as a professional flyweight we felt no show would be complete without him and it was arranged he should box three exhibition rounds with bassett as briggs said with people who pay money you must give everybody something they will like and though the people who would come to see shakespeare acted might not be at all the same people who would come to see rice hammer bassett yet there it was we didn't want to disappoint anybody because the great thing with a successful entertainment is to make everybody thoroughly feel that they have had their money's worth as mitchell pointed out 
he was going to take the money and sit in the box and give out the tickets he could have done other things but chose that himself having great natural ability and everything of a financial sort and as all the tickets were numbered we felt it was safe besides for the red cross nobody would let his financial ability lead him astray so to speak percy minor the son of the famous professional actor also wished to play shylock but was put down for a comic song an art in which he excelled and tracy wanted to write it for him and make it topical but we knew tracy's satire and felt it would not do besides he'd already written a whole play as it was and was performing the chief part in it so we let percy minor choose his own song and he chose one of albert chevalier's which blended pathos and humour in a very wonderful way but was difficult this left five items and it seemed almost a shame to leave out so much talent but we finally decided on abbott for a conjuring entertainment him being a flyer at that art and on nicholas who has the great gift of lightning calculation though strange to say a fool in everything else he stands with his back to a blackboard and can divide or add in his head and if you read him out ten figures and then ten more to subtract from them he can do it in a moment and no doubt he will make his living in this way though it is a science that is utterly useless in the world at large allowing for cornwallis and towler there were only two items left and i had the good luck to remember there was so far nothing about the red cross in the whole show so we asked fortescue if he would allow a recitation of his famous poem on that subject and he consented if he was allowed to coach the boy who did it we gladly agreed to this and forrester was decided upon for the boy though he would rather have given his well-known and remarkable imitation of natural sounds such as a cock crowing or a bottle of ginger beer popping or a man with a cold in his head or a distant military band it was decided therefore that if forrester got an encore he might give the imitations but he didn't so they were unfortunately lost though many a paying audience would have liked them better than the recitation splendid as it was for the last item of all it was almost impossible to choose between about ten chaps and at last after voting in secret several times the six got it down to young hastings who could play the fiddle in a manner seldom heard from a kid of nine years old and weston who was prepared to black his face and play his banjo finally we decided for weston because he was the eldest and would be leaving next term but one whereas hastings being only nine was bound to have many future chances of appearing with his fiddle so that was the program and even when drawn out and written down it was pretty staggering but when actually printed in regular program form it was wonderful and for my part i didn't see how the big schoolroom would hold half the people who were bound to come in fact i suggested giving two or even three performances on consecutive nights but this was not approved of being as you may say historical i will here insert the program the price was threepence or what you liked to give above that sum many gave more some got copies for nothing owing to the program kids losing their heads about change it appeared in this way on pink paper faintly scented and nothing was charged for the scenting by the printers so i suppose the scent was their contribution to the red cross fund for the red cross on the seventeenth day of december next by kind permission of dr dunston the scholars of merivale will give the following entertainment in the great hall of merivale school at seven thirty p m doors open at seven o'clock but reserved seats may be booked and a plan of the room seen at messrs thompson's number four high street merivale the program one song by percy minimus son of the world-famous actor thomas percy two conjuring by abbott using live rabbits live goldfish etc three three rounds of exhibition boxing by rice flyweight champion and bassett n b the rounds will be of two minutes duration four glee singing by the school glee singers five recitation the cross of red words published in the times newspaper by mr fortescue of merivale school reciter forrester six the trial scene from the merchant of venice by william shakespeare dramatis personae as follows 
shylock thwaites the duke pegram antonio saunders bassanio preston graziano percy minor salario travers minor nerissa percy minimus portia williams magnificos tudor forbes minimus hastings and five others scene venice a court of justice n b the scene will conclude with the exit of shylock an interval of ten minutes part two seven glee singing by the school glee singers the three chafers by request eight comic song percy minor son of the great actor thomas percy nine lightning calculation nicholas introduced by thwaites must be seen to be believed ten coon interlude with banjo weston eleven duet towler and cornwallis both nearly drowned last summer on foster day twelve a satire in one act by tracy entitled the white feather dramatis personae captain harold van sittert maltravers b c tracy general sir henry champernon k c b blades a policeman briggs miss sophia flapperkin williams scene trafalgar square time the present god save the king booking office mitchell well that was the program and seeing the front seats were only half a crown there didn't seem much chance of anybody not getting their money's worth i could say a great deal about the rehearsals which were very difficult owing to the question of scenery and finally after many suggestions we decided merely to have wings and leave the rest to the imagination because we couldn't get within miles of a court in venice and trafalgar square was equally out of the question and percy minor said that really classy stage managers like granville barker relied less and less on scenery and that the very highest art was to go back to elizabethan times and just stick up what the scene was on a curtain and if people didn't like it they could do the other thing so we went back to elizabethan times but we had a professional man from plymouth to make us up for shakespeare and he did it professionally and we were rather dazzled ourselves at what we looked like on the night seen close you're awful but of course it's all right from the front the dresses for shakespeare were also professional and we had help for without the matron and nelly dunston and minnie dunston and a maid or two the dresses would not have fitted and so caused derision but they did well and we looked very realistic though my jewish gabardine was too long to the last however nobody noticed though naturally they did notice when antonio's beard carried away and it spoilt the pathos because some fools laughed instead of taking no notice as any decent chaps would have well of course the excitement was to see how the half-crown seats went off at dowson's and they weren't gone in a moment by any means you could book both half-crowners and eighteen pennies which came next and people put off their booking a good deal but when the program was out the booking improved and five people booked in one day it was rather interesting to hear who had booked and mitchell was allowed to go to the shop every morning after school to know how things were going sir neville carew from the manor house took five half-crown seats in the front row and dr dunston himself took the next five this news we greeted with mingled feelings yet as mitchell pointed out he might have had them for nothing which was true the masters all took half-crown seats dotted about the big hall and when briggs asked brown why they had done this instead of sitting together brown said to applaud your efforts briggs and suggest a consensus of opinion if we can as a matter of fact we didn't want their wretched applause when the time came for we got plenty without it the most sensational person to take a half-crown seat was old black from next door he had always been our greatest enemy and hated us and he never gave anything back that went over his wall and made us pay instantly if we did any damage or broke a pane of glass or anything yet there he was he sat in the second row and not a muscle moved from first to last and he never clapped once yet extraordinary to say the most remarkable thing about the whole performance had to do with old black though the amazing affair didn't come out till next morning 
mitchell calculated that if every seat was taken we should clear thirty four pounds odd and he rather hoped the programmes would bring in about thirty six from that however had to be subtracted the cost of the dresses and the professional man from plymouth and also the cost of the programmes and the piano man it looked as if we should be good for a clear thirty pounds but only if the house was full happy to relate it was and many people who did not book at all came and took their tickets at the door and the one bob part was packed in fact a good many stood all through including those interested in merivale in humbler ways such as the tuck woman and the ground man and the drill sergeant and many other such like people when therefore after the interval for refreshments dr dunstan got up and said we had taken thirty seven pounds four shillings there was great cheering and most did not hide their surprise a reporter came from the merivale trumpet and mitchell saw that he had plenty of refreshments for nothing because this was expected by reporters and much depends on it he ate and drank well so we naturally hoped for a column or two about the show but the cur wrote a most feeble account in three inches of type and gave all the praise to dr dunstan so i need not repeat what he said the truth was as follows and i shall take the programme by its items and be perfectly fair about it i don't pretend everything went off as well as we hoped and some of the chaps didn't come off at all but on the other hand many did and the failures also got a friendly greeting and even if you make a person laugh quite differently from what you expected it's better than if he doesn't laugh at all besides we had to remember that everybody had paid solid cash so it wasn't like a free show where people have got to be pleased or pretend to be because when you have paid your money you are free to display your feelings and if people in a paying audience are such utter bounders as to laugh in the wrong places there's no law against it and the performers must jolly well stick it as best they can well of course percy minimus was a certainty and the start was excellent in fact some people wanted to encore him but this did not happen though he would have sung again because the live rabbit which abbott had borrowed from bellamy for his illusions broke loose and dashed on to the platform so when the audience expected percy back instead there appeared a large lop-eared white rabbit with a brown behind it looked of course as if abbott had already begun to conjure and in fact had turned percy into a lop-eared rabbit anyway the people were so much interested that they stopped encoring percy and seemed inclined to encore the bewildered rabbit then abbott appeared and caught the rabbit which had rather ruined his show by appearing in this way and vernon and montgomery who were his assistants brought on the magic table with various objects arranged upon it for the tricks unfortunately abbott was very nervous which is a most dangerous thing for a conjurer to be and tricks which he would have done to perfection during school hours or in the home circle so to say got fairly mucked up before the paying audience he put on an appearance of great ease but he couldn't manage his voice and he forgot his patter and he also forgot how to palm and kept dropping secret things at awkward moments and making footling jokes to hide his confusion the people were frightfully kind and patient and that made him worse i believe if they had hissed it might have bucked him up he forced a card as he thought on old black and after messing about with a pistol and an orange and a silk handkerchief and some unseen contrivances he made the ace of spades appear in a bouquet of imitation flowers and then challenged old black to show his card which he did do and it unfortunately turned out to be the four of hearts this fairly broke abbott and when it came to bringing the lop-eared rabbit out of a borrowed hat every soul in that paying audience saw him put it in first it is true he tried to conceal it and a mass of other things under a huge flag supposed to be the union jack but the rabbit who had never been conjured with before and hated it kicked violently and defied concealment so to say however abbott got a lot of trick flowers and vegetables and about half a mile of yellow ribbon into that hat at the same time as the rabbit and the audience had not seen him do this so they were slightly mystified and applauded in a weary sort of way he finished up by bringing a bowl of goldfish out of a dice with white spots on it and though there was no great deception it passed off safely for the goldfish 
then abbott bowed and cleared out and thanks to fortescue who is fond of abbott and said bravo and tried to work up some applause there was no absolute blank when he had done but montgomery and vernon who had to clear up the debris afterwards got one of the best laughs of the night because they became fearfully entangled in the yellow ribbon and thoughtless people were a good deal amused to see it then came rice and bassett in shorts with a new pair of boxing gloves a chair was put in each corner of the stage and the seconds stood by the chairs it was all pure science but only a few chaps at the back appreciated them and when as bad luck would have it rice tapped bassett's ruby in the first round the women part of the audience gurgled and gave little yelps and screams it was nothing but evidently appeared strange and dreadful to them so the doctor stopped the exhibition and that item had to be put down as an utter failure perhaps it was a silly thing to have arranged for a mixed audience but we had to think of rice's feelings and we also knew that scores of countesses and duchesses go to see carpentier and wells and such like in real fights so we little dreamed anybody would squirm at a harmless exhibition bout that wouldn't have shaken a flea but it was so and consequently the glee singers were a great relief and while they warbled their simple lays the female part of the audience recovered of course we thespians did not see any of these things as we were all making up for the great trial scene forrester got fair applause for fortescue's fine poem but nothing special as a matter of fact he forgot the third verse which was the best and doubtless fortescue felt very sick about it but he was powerless to do anything though he never much liked forrester after then came the grand item and it was good in every way and went very smoothly till just the end of course i can't say anything about my rendition of shylock in fact i didn't feel i had gripped the audience in the least but chaps told me you might have heard a pin drop and nobody recognized me who knew me and many of the people in the audience thought it was one of the masters and not a boy at all pegram rather overreacted the duke which is a part that merely wants stateliness and no acting but he would act and so forgot his words and hung us up once or twice in fact pegram was not good but antonio by saunders was a very thoughtful performance and so was bassanio by preston percy minor certainly came off as graziano and unfortunately he acted so jolly well that in one of his fearful scores off me i forgot the dignified pathos of shylock and laughed it was a new reading in a way but i didn't mean to laugh and it did a lot of harm because after that the audience wouldn't take me seriously though before i believe most of them had it spoiled the illusion of the scene portia in the hands of williams was most beautiful to see but from the art point of view awful he got out his words however and just at the end before my exit many dunstan who had plotted it with him in secret threw him a bouquet of white chrysanthemums and the fool picked it up and said out loud thank you many of course after that my exit went for nothing and when it was over i punched his head behind the scenes while in front people were laughing themselves silly we got two calls and it shows what a force the drama really is because in the second half of the program nobody cared a button about such excellent things as percy minor's comic song and though Towler and cornwallis were mildly applauded it was only because they happened to be still alive and not dead and the lightning calculations of nichols didn't even tempt many men to come away from the refreshments i dare say many of them were very poor and had to make so many lightning calculations themselves owing to the war that they weren't specially interested in what nicholas could do but for tracy's play they all came and such applause was never heard within the walls of maryvale which shows that the drama still holds its own the idea of the white feather was certainly very original and the dialogue very satirical as the girl with the white feathers williams appeared again in a dress lent him by minnie dunstan this was too small in some places and too big in others but thanks to a huge female hat and a wig of golden hair williams made a very fair flapper though inches too tall for such a creature 
he gave a feather to captain maltravers v c from gallipoli who was in mufti and tracy with an eyeglass which he manages fairly well and a moustache was frightfully satirical at the flapper's expense and every point he made went with a roar then the flapper stuck a white feather into the frock coat of general sir champernon also in mufti and he was not satirical but got into a frightful rage and gave up the flapper to a policeman she cried and begged for pardon and then the v c returned and saved her from the general and the policeman and promised to marry her after the war the house was fairly convulsed and it was really jolly true to nature so much so that the pianist almost forgot god save the king when all was over for though a professional and well used to entertainments he laughed as much as anybody then the people came like shadows and so departed in the words of the immortal bard and not until next day did the final stupendous thing happen with old black he looked over the playground wall just before dinner as he often did to make a beast of himself about something and seeing me and weston and another chap or two kicking about a football he said to me are you the boy thwaites and i said i was then he said come in thwaites i want to speak to you my first thought was what had i done but as i hadn't had any row with old black for two terms my withers were unwrung and i went and he took me into his study and handed me a bit of pink paper with writing on it what's this sir i asked a check for the red cross he answered a check for twenty guineas to add to the money from your performance last night he was scowling all the time mind you and looking as if he hated the show i'm sure it's very sporting of you sir i said to old black not in the least he replied i laughed more last night than i've laughed for fifty years and i only paid half a crown much too little for what i got i was fearfully amazed excuse me sir i said but i didn't see you laugh once no he answered and nor did anybody else when i laugh i laugh inside boy not outside so do most wise men now be off and when you next play shylock let me know if i'm alive i'll come so i went and we cheered old black from the playground he must have heard us but he didn't show up certainly taking one thing with another there are many extraordinary people in the world and you may be surprised at any moment no doubt it was one of those cases of coming to scoff and remaining to pray that you hear about but don't often actually see End of story twelve